Booga Booga. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a week. It's been a long week, a long rest after a after a long uh, content-filled season of, of shenanigans. Mm-hmm. And maybe you've listened to our finale episode, which released recently. Um, maybe not. This this surely seems like a short break to you, dear <laughs> listener, but it is not for us. As um, we we did quite a, a good bit of recording um, prior to releasing over the summer. Mm-hmm. So uh, hopefully you'll notice that we are refreshed as ever and uh, keen no. to be back in the mix of, of discussing <laughs> film. Uh, I'm joined by Zach and Mitchell as always, and this is our Halloween special Ooh. for this year. And today we are discussing. <laughs> Get Out, Jordan Peele's okay, directorial debut, um, met with massive uh, critical acclaim and uh, popularity, and this was actually my first time with it. So I, I kind of, it's been on my list for a long time, but I think it's been off streaming for like forever, at least for the for the past three years or so until recently. And so at some point, I just I, I saw the Blu-ray on sale and I grabbed it and I thought, okay, this would be a fun one uh, for the pod. So here we are. Ready to discuss. So, uh, ratings out of five, general thoughts. Have you guys seen it before, and what did you think of Get Out this time? Yeah, so I had seen it once before. I saw this in my freshman year of college at a poorly screened Black Lives Matter event. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, Christian said he would he would roast me for my, my review <laughs> from that period. So I'm, I'm getting in front of that right now and saying that <laughs> it was a poor screening even though I still had fun with the movie. And in those days, I was posting everything to Twitter. I didn't have a letterbox at the time, so my review was limited to 240 characters. But I, I still... I think you mean X, Zach. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it was Twitter at the time. Um, That's true. But uh, I, still, I still stand by my comments in that original review, even if I don't maybe agree with the tone. Um, cause my original review by necessity of having to make it short is kind of dismissive. Um, when I think the overall message I was trying to get across is that I think it's kind of obvious that this is a directorial debut. It's a little scrappy. It's a little, I, I particularly this watch round found it to be very much influenced by like John Carpenter films, which Jordan Peele has said that he really enjoys and has nodded to as an influence before. I don't really think they're as much of an influence on his more current work, like Nope, than they are here, but there definitely seems to be some influence there. So, you know, he's a filmmaker kind of feeling out what he can achieve and what he can make and what he's comfortable with. Um, There is a lot of comedy in this and I would say that the comedy feels a little more divorced from the drama than maybe it does in his other stuff so he's still kind of breaking in the mold of how he is how he works as a filmmaker instead of a comedian slash actor but I I do enjoy it Uh, I gave it a 3 out of 5 on both times and I I stand by my 3 out of 5 because I think it's I think it's a solid film but at the same time I don't really think it's like a masterpiece i think it's solid film the solid concept it's a clever concept but and this could also be the case of it being a victim of its own reputation because i saw this Mm -hmm. maybe like six months after no more than that a couple years after it's like big blow up and it won uh, best original screenplay so by this point, by the time I watched it, the the hype wave I had kind of experienced and I was on the other side and like, well, all right, hype me up, Jordan. Um, and uh, <laughs> I mean, it was fun, but I wasn't I wasn't hyped. Um, this has been a, a tangential thoughts, but I, I enjoyed it, but I don't think it's amazing. That's my <laughs> my review. That's. <laughs> Mm. Mm -hmm. okay a new Mm -hmm. hope sized three out of five Mm -hmm. perhaps sure i i should mention Mm. there's a lot of films i really really Mm. like that i still only give a three out of five (laughs) no keep it there because there's a lot of films that zach really likes that's what i learned (laughs) because not because i think that that's like an insult to the film's quality but just because i think that best reflects what the film is doing and what the film achieves. Like, a, an example would be, like, John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. I love that movie. I watch it basically every Halloween. But that's, like, a solid, satisfying 3 out of 5 because it's good. But it's not great. I still like it, but it's not great. 
All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was a fan of Key and Peele every day it was coming out, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Just to preface this, um, I was an avid Key and Peele fan for a very long time. But um, I so I saw this for the first time, like, basically, I think I saw it opening day or wow. one of the first few days wow. that it came out. Um, and I feel like this is important to mention. I was the only white guy that was watching it with <laughs> other people. And that was an interesting experience, to say the least, at AMC. But um, I do think that that was because of the uh, Peel trying to portray the black experience. I do think it was more enjoyable and more culturally investing to have to, to watch it with other black people. Um, and I think that definitely contributed to how I saw it then versus how I saw it now, just watching it in my living room <laughs> by myself. Hmm. Yes, I do. I, I think <laughs> Jesse Owens was a great athlete. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I, I really enjoy the concept. I think the concept, I, can't, I couldn't think of anything that had really done anything like that before. Um, and then this is when Zach thinks in his brain, like, oh, there's been like 10 other things that have been. <laughs> um, but no, I, I really, I really thought that it was a very compelling concept and it kind of weaved its way through the tone and the themes. It kind of felt like a very pretty much a lot of the time it felt overbearing when it came to producing the thrills. And mm-hmm. I feel like it wasn't like, oh, they're focusing too much on the racial aspect, therefore movie bad. It was more like, it, it, it kind of felt like the thrills and the themes and the character progression, everything was hinging on that concept the whole time. Uh, and that was very bothersome, especially kind of middle to end of the second act for me. And it was kind of just making me want to see what was going to happen because I, I, like I said, I saw this 2017, so I kind of vaguely remembered how the ending happened or spoiler alert, the cotton ball mm-hmm. thing, uh, happened. Um, and once that third act kicks in, I'm like, this is great. It's like a protagonist that really knows what he's doing. It doesn't feel rushed. It feels very realistic. So uh, the third act was my by far my favorite. Um, mm. I think at the very beginning, I think introducing those themes by, like, carrying the viewer into a, uh, like, you kind of know, you, you, you understand the stereotypes that are being targeted, and you understand, like, it starts off with him asking her about, uh, do they know that I'm black kind of thing and then you're like oh and then the, the cop thing happens and you're like okay this is like the black experience type thing but then it turns into like a horror thing and I think that conceptually is great but when it hinges like that whole the whole story is hinging on that and then you have the the, the TSA <laughs> sidebar <laughs> key and peel skits yeah. you know then it's like you start to get a little bit dazed and you're wondering like okay what what else is there to offer from this conceptually? Uh, and I think that's just my biggest criticism. And it was kind of a constant thing, but I wouldn't really criticize the way that the story played out towards the end. And I wouldn't really criticize the way it ended, which is kind of weird because usually I would think that if thematically a movie is not really working for me, then it, it normally it's not going to find the right way to end it itself. And in this case, it was kind of the opposite. Hmm. Um, it, it found a way to, to vaguely start itself, but not carry it on until the actual action started happening at the end. And, and we kind of just see what the viewer is kind of asking for the whole time, which I thought was really uh, great. And I felt I felt a director's vision in that last act, too. Like he wanted this to feel realistic and be like, I'm getting the F out of here kind of uh, mm-hmm. protagonist. And I think that's awesome. So I give it a three out of five. I'm right with Zach. I think everything cinematically with it is is pretty solid. I wouldn't really say anything's bad. Um, Maybe some acting moments, but uh, otherwise, like, it felt like a directorial debut to me. But I really I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would the second time around. Hmm. Okay. Christian's about to well, throw down. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not. I'm just thinking of, of what angle I want to approach this at. Um, well, I had never seen this before, as I, as I already said, mm-hmm. and um, most of my friends and, and cohorts had, and uh, especially since starting this podcast when, you know, if I'm having a, a casual conversation with a new acquaintance or, or something, or, or, you know, you're, you're sussing out the interests of someone you're, you're, you're talking with, I often mention my interest in, in movies, and maybe if I'm feeling especially brave, I mention the podcast element of it, too. <laughs> <But Ooh. laughs> not always. That's risky. And... Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes, uh, the first few things I'm, I'm asked are like, uh, there's like a, a list of like five to ten classic or like current super popular movies like Parasite um, and Rocky. Um, I watched Rocky more recently, but those two and especially Get Out were like the three films I got the most often that people were like outraged with me that I hadn't seen them because I had <laughs> put myself forward as a movie buff. And my answer to that question, um, to that, why haven't you seen this already, dude? Like, come on, is um, I don't necessarily want to watch um, everything, uh, every classic film or everything that's reached wide acclaim with audiences and critics uh, today in the order of like most acclaimed to least acclaimed, because then at some point I'm going to run out of classics. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run out of, of, you know, um, big name crowd pleasers and I, I personally like to balance my, my watch list out more with like indie stuff, uh, things I'm more drawn to for genre reasons, whatever, going down an actor's CV or director's, um, you know. Um, and, and I think that approach is, has kept movie watching as a hobby fresher for me than just, you know, watching the, the 10 movies that everyone else is watching. But um, with all that being said, um, despite not having seen it for the first five years or so or six years or so of its existence, I pretty much knew nothing about Get Out other than um, Daniel Kaluuya being the lead. I knew Steven Root was in it, but I didn't really know in what capacity. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was there was an angle on race relations in the in the United States. And, and I, I guess I could pretty easily infer that the white family was going to become the, the horror threat at some point. But I didn't really know how. Um, I didn't know the sort of like body exploitation angle, which I think is really clever. And um, I, I, yeah, I, I was marveling at this. I, I think it's executed pretty much perfectly. I gave it a four and a half out of five. If I didn't do half stars, I, I might give it a five. Cool. I was really quite impressed by it. And um, uh, I'm a big Keen Peel fan as well. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Peel's writing in general. I think he's he's just super sharp. And I had seen Nope in theaters. And the last act of Nope left me with mixed feelings. But by and large, I thought that was a great film too. So um, I, I did have reasonably high expectations for this, you know, with with uh, with its reputation and, and having so many friends that loved it. Um, I, and uh, I, I watched this a couple of days ago, and then um, I, I kind of put my parents onto it because um, the the Blu-ray I'd gotten came with a digital code, mm. so I could uh, get it in our Amazon library and then get my parents to watch it um, uh, where they are, even though the disc is with me. So um, that was great, and they enjoyed it too. And um, while, while chatting with them, I, I sort of likened um, Peel's ability as a writer um, and this screenplay and the way it flows so so easily, I think, to this this is going to sound like a stretch to something like Monsters Inc., which mm. on, on its surface, mm. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I know. On its surface, I don't think anyone looks at Monsters Inc. and, and thinks what a seamless story with precise dialogue well, that flows like like a flowing stream okay. with but, racial undertones. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I do think like part of the um, commendability of, of something like like Get Out or, or Monsters Inc. is that I think it's really hard to write something that just goes and and none of it none of Get Out feels like fat to me. It doesn't feel like a single scene um, exists um, sort of extraneously to the plot or um, extraneously to its own um, merit as as a standalone scene and. Um, even like the the swings, Zach, that you mentioned with the um, like the TSA cutaways or whatever, um, th those tonal shifts should bother me and would bother me in most cases, but it totally didn't here because um, I, I just think he lands everything with the way he writes his characters. And um, gosh, I, I could keep keep talking, but um, I, <laughs> I should uh, uh, yield the floor again. Um, this is Peel's first time directing a major feature film. Um, I believe it's the first time he's written a, a feature length thing as well. So. Um, did he write Keanu? We, we, you've already, oh, yeah, he did write okay. Keanu. That's true. Um, though, though I wonder <laughs> if, um, I don't know if, if Keegan Michael Key um, co wrote that or not. Yeah. But, um, he did write Keanu. Okay. Mm. Keanu is fun, but it's not. Um, it's not Get Out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's definitely got the feeling of a TV movie, but um, 
Yeah, that that Keanu is like a feature length uh, Key and yeah. Peele uh, skit, pretty much, which <laughs> which uh, has all of the drawbacks and, and positives that that label might might come with. Um, gosh, uh, you guys already touched on the direction a little bit, but I just want to ask you more broadly: What did you make of the writing and the dialogue, and what did you make of Peele as a director, um, not just in the way that he frames his scenes and visualizes them, but also in the way that he sort of encourages. Uh, performances from his actors. Um, do you think that um, he had a good rapport with these actors? And um, do you like generally how he approached um, these situations and these characters? I... Now, I haven't seen Us, so it, it's... Me neither. It's, it's difficult to talk about Jordan Peele like as a filmmaker as a whole right now, because he's only had three movies. And despite the fact that I have liked the two of those that I have seen... I am still holding out on that, like, master of the cinema reputation that so many people have given to him because they said that about M. Night Shyamalan. And then he had, like, eight years where he made nothing but big fat goose eggs <laughs> one after another. <laughs> you watch your um, mouth. Only the last airbender. <laughs> but I, I think I really appreciate the direction and the style in this film and his work with the actors in this film because when set against Nope, which is a film I like a lot more, I, I think it shows like a progress um, in, in mm -hmm. his ability. Like everything he does in this movie is competent and well done and fine. But I think everything that he does in that later film is so much more adept and skillful and really shows off just how far he's come in uh, five years, only five years. Um, yeah. And I think that's really impressive. Like, we talked about the, the TSA cutaways in this and how, for the most part, this is kind of a serious story with maybe the occasional glib line here and there. And then every now and then we call, we pick up the phone to call a Key and Peel sketch happening at, like, Dulles Airport or wherever on the other side of the country. <laughs> um, it, but in a movie like Nope... That, that's not really how the comedy's integrated. It's it's integrated a lot more naturally into, into the flow of the film. In Get Out, we get these, like, big acting moments from the characters, and they have their, their kind of Oscar moments, but they feel kind of isolated to those moments. And then outside of it, they're just kind of playing the character that moves them the narrative. In a film like mm -hmm. Nope, I think that feels a lot more naturally incorporated, and there's more of an ebb and flow between those scenes, and they feel... A little less sudden um, but then again I do also think that's just the result of influences he's working from um, like if this film is a lot more inspired by like Carpenter and Toby Hooper and the 80s horror masters then that's the kind of film he's made he's made this very workmanlike efficient widescreen limited coverage movie where things happen in like one or two shots and the tensions kept up, and then by the time we get to Nope, I think the main reference is uh, directors like Spielberg, uh, where things are a lot more complex and snappy, and it's more of an adventure than it is a, a slowly paced B horror film that takes itself seriously. Um, so yeah, I do enjoy this film, and there's nothing that I, I I'm trying to knock it down for, but I just think when set against kind of the progress that uh, that Peel has made in his career and where he may yet go, I I don't feel a need to give it like full marks because I think it's a step to what could be bigger and better things. Mm. Mm-hmm. 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 I haven't seen Nope yet. <laughs> uh, have you seen <laughs> <I'm> Us? <sorry. laughs> okay. No. I hear Us actually isn't that good. I so I, I'm eager to see it but it's mm. definitely gotten the the most mm. mixed of, of reputation of the three of them yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'd also see the the kubrick influence especially because mm. eyes, eyes wide shut is literally referenced yes yeah and, <laughs> uh, ob obvious clockwork orange hypnotism type mm. stuff going on too uh so i think zach brought up an interesting point about incorporation and i do think that might be one of my primary issues is that the the acting potential is there and the the like the performances in general were were fairly good and i i think maybe some some of the awkward quote unquote like bad acting moments of the white family is like part of their character and part of like their stereotype mm -hmm. 
and I understand that that's like the point because this it's it, it, at least in in my in my viewing experience, my audience layman experience, it is a lot easier to play a stereotype that's already existed versus making your own character. So I think playing into that stereotype more makes sense, like conceptually, but on execution, it doesn't really stick with me too much as from like a believability standpoint. I think in terms of uh, like in terms of the protagonist and um, uh, Lil Ray, I think that they're like, they seem like they're playing their own people, like they're playing their own characters like how they would be in real life uh and like the white people don't <laughs> i guess is what i'm trying to say uh and I, I th- but maybe except steven root because yeah, my ask. first exposure to steven root actually uh there is huge hype uh in man in the high castle because he's the man in the high oh. castle he plays the man in the high castle anyway uh and and he's kind of like an extremely important character you've been waiting for for like i think it was two two seasons uh up until they finally reveal him so it was a pretty big deal, Stephen Root, uh, and I think, I think he was the most like interesting character. He was the most well acted and believable character from that standpoint. But uh, yeah, otherwise between really those three characters, I don't think, I don't think like the, the, the acting really stood out to me as much. It definitely came across as more of a directorial uh, debut. Uh, but yeah, I think it's the the execution of the incorporation is the biggest thing like just incorporating incorporating those those character designs in, into your unique like one trick pony thematic concept is like where the difficulty comes from and and perhaps Zach is right with the progression thing because I, maybe like you had mentioned like taking from different sources kind of comes across a lot here uh, but yeah I mean in terms of like the performances in general um, I think they were definitely workable. Like at worst, they were they served the narrative, and can't can't shoot shoot anybody down for that. So <laughs> I think it would not, because you mentioned the the parents and the family. Um, yeah. Key and Peele on the on the show, every now and then there's like a horror comedy sketch where it's really apparent that Jordan Peele was like, hey. Uh, can I do this little one, like just for this one episode? Like I promise, we don't won't do another yeah. one for another couple of episodes. <laughs> and the sinister characters in Get Out, a lot of the time, kind of feel like sinister characters in a Key and Peele sketch. Yeah, They're, the the tone of the that. scenes yeah. is different, but there are moments mm-hmm. in this where I was like, I could totally see that in a Key and Peele sketch. In particular, um, I wrote it down when it happened. Let me find the line. Uh, a real doggone keeper. I could totally see that yeah. being in a Key and Peele sketch. <laughs> yeah. The the awkward parents. That kind of feels like it mm-hmm. could be yeah. Key and Peele as well, because it's very heightened. And and uh, you, I mean, this is kind of getting into like cinema sins nitpicky territory. But you could argue that <laughs> oh, like no. that awkwardness is deliberate because they're really playing their parts of like we're welcoming but kind of awkward because we don't totally get it. But then that also brings up, mm-hmm. like, how have they done this with, like, 18 people if they're, like, they give the game away th- th- this much? And it does feel like maybe they're yeah. playing the hand hmm. a little. Um, but that is, I mean, that's in service of the reveal at the end. So, like I said, that's getting into real, like, ding. Uh, how has nobody noticed this yet? Yeah. You know. Um, and I, yeah. <laughs> how could this work? How could this happen? Yeah, I don't know. I, I I'll, I'll push back on that one a little bit, Zach. <laughs> I, I think um, mm, because I think mm. they're playing to his expectations more than anything else, at least at the outset. Yeah. And like, I mean, like the first thing he tells um, his girlfriend at the end of like the first day, when when there's these awkward microaggressions or whatever, the first thing he tells her is, "I told you so." Mm-hmm. So i obviously over the course of the runtime, it gets ratcheted up, and and then he begins to grow suspicious but i think that they are matching his expectations more than anything else more than actually Mm -hmm. trying to present themselves as welcoming normal um you know uh, i don't see color people or or something (laughs) like that yeah Um, i i think daniel kaluuya is amazing in this i think the the scene where um katherine keener is hypnotizing him um on her end I, I definitely see what you mean, Zach, when that's kind of like her Oscar moment and then like the rest of it is just kind of she's in her she's occupying her space in the story and mm-hmm. not doing much more. But um I think what he's doing there, um, with his eyes and, and um 
gosh, the way he's just like falling and um, as much as falling as much as when he's just sitting in the chair as when you they actually show him in the the sunken place I think they call it um yeah I think he's he's awesome and um I didn't know Lakeith Stanfield was in this oh my gosh oh, really? I had no clue and um yeah because I'd, I'd done so so much to avoid seeing anything about this and he's like billed like eighth or ninth on on the on the cast and he's I think also amazing like this opening scene where he's just like doing everything right in this like street smart situation or whatever and and he still gets captured and the um his the distinction between when he's playing um his character um as himself and um his his body being being stolen um is just like so deeply upsetting probably like the most like viscerally uh, affecting bit in, in the film for me is when you realize that he's not him anymore um and I just think, um, in general, and I- I'm sure Zach, you can probably um, think of many reference points for this sort of like body snatching exploitation angle in, in horror in general as a as a tradition or-, or something that's been explored in other horror films. But um, I think it's a really clever and well executed choice given the sort of uh, sociological and and racial. I, I would say overtones, not even undertones. I mean, it's 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 yeah. it's very much on the surface and and you know integral to the to what what he's going for here. But um, I mean, just like the I think just like tracing back the history of like the the African American experience um, from you know slavery to sharecropping and Jim Crow. Um, there's this sort of idea that that um, the, that black people didn't like have agency over their own bodies Mm. and i think it's it's a really you know uncomfortable but brilliant extrapolation of of that reality here um to something that's like fictitious and deeply uncomfortable but also somehow really enjoyable to watch and um ends in in a positive way but doesn't feel too cliched in that sense um yeah I i don't even think i have the vocabulary to to process like the ebbs and flows of this like um when when he walks up to the to the house for the first time and it's this really wide shot of like the whole mansion um and you immediately get the sense that it sort of mirrors a a plantation Mm. and um um you you can hear um it's not super prominent in the mix because it's such a wide shot, but you can hear the dad saying, my man, and bringing him in for a hug. Yeah. And I, I just like, Oof, I literally like exhale loudly. And uh, there's like 10 other moments like that. And you know it's coming, but it's still just, um, and I agree that it's, that those characters are like caricatures in those moments, but I think it's so effective in, in the context that I, that I can't hold that against the film too much. Um, uh, Mitchell, you already referenced the third act as your favorite, and that's kind of when things get really crazy and and um, things are discovered. So, I-, I wanted to ask you guys more broadly about the discovery. Um, when did you start piecing things together? When did you um, also spoiler alert? Obviously, if you oh, haven't already yeah. picked up on that. <laughs> um, um, when did you guys piece together, if if ever, before the film explicitly points out that his girlfriend is in on it, and um, yeah, when did you realize things? Do, do you feel like it, uh, did you see earlier parts of the film differently? And ultimately, did you like the ending that they went with? I think, so I unfortunately can't really speak for the twist because by the time I actually okay. saw it, um, three years after it came out, I think, at least two years, um, I already basically knew the twist. I didn't entirely know like the reasoning behind it. And the the kind of like well, black is cool now type type reasoning, which I, which I think um, works towards the twist's favor and means that at least you know in that case I still had some kind of a surprise as to the motivation. Um, but I can't totally speak to recognizing it for the first time. But I do think there's lots of nice little touches in the script to establish that uh, eventual uh, reveal early on, um, like even as early as. Um, when they get pulled over, uh, yes, you know she kind of argues like, "Oh well, you don't need to see his license as like a as a defending him type thing against this racist cop." But 
uh, viewed through the lens of the twist, she's actually just trying to prevent a paper trail uh, and trying to prevent any record of him being in the area and driven to her home. Um, and I think that's that's a really early occasion. Uh, I th- probably the earliest where kind of the twist maybe hints at itself. Um, I think there is... Some of the stuff later, I think, is... is uh, a little more heavy-handed. Uh, I, I think maybe um, I forget what the what the body that the dad in or the granddad's uh, uh, the body that the granddad inhabits. What they call him? Oh, uh, um, Walter. Walter. But him running around, I think, is one that's that's a a connection that's easier to make. I think, um, and becomes a little more a little more obvious. But even past that, even like past the twist, I think there's a lot of great just visual cues and little things in the set and the production design that work toward the race angle. Um, like when um, she's eating her, her Fruit Loops and milk, but they're separated because she <laughs> separated the, the white from the colors. Oh um, my gosh, mm-hmm. I did not even put that together. <laughs> There's lots of, of great little touches like that that I think help to elevate the, the kind of schlocky plot. I mean, I, I would put this alongside mm-hmm. And this is not a flattering title, so this doesn't sound like a great comparison. But, you know, when you think of, like, uh, classic black horror films, so something like Blackula, which is such an Ah, exploitative title, (laughs) but that movie actually has, like, a really interesting, like, African angle on the Dracula and vampire story, and it surprisingly kind of elevates this really schlocky, corny idea um, to the point that, I, I knew people in high school who were like, oh yeah, we watch that every every Halloween. Um, my my dad <laughs> loves it or whatever. Um, our, our friend Ariel uh, told me that one one Halloween actually. Oh my gosh. Um, wow. But yeah, I, I would put this alongside that kind of thing where it's a schlocky B concept, but the way that it's delivered and executed and that includes that the twist carried throughout and hinted at really subtly and maybe less subtly, I think it helps to elevate it to something more. I want to jump in and, and just be your defense lawyer for like two seconds, Zach. Uh, what did I do? Because I'm just, a, I'm just a little worried that people will hear the phrase uh, schlocky B-movie and take it the wrong way. But I just want to reassure uh, okay. our listeners that Zach is often a huge fan of the schlocky B-movies out there. Yes. And that, that phrase mm-hmm. comes with a genuine compliment, not, not a degrading angle. That's true. <laughs> a, a schlocky B-movie is not a dirty word for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Hmm. I almost forgot. I was thinking about Schlocky, and I just forgot what the question was. Uh, it had, it, it, oh, man. What were we talking about, Christian? I don't, I don't remember either. Uh, well, I'll, I'll oh, the ending. Of, like, the ending, of what ending was Zach one of the said. things, I think. Oh, okay. I'll go yeah. off of what Zach said. Um, I think uh, I, I enjoy the visual cues, and I think they do elevate the themes to – to an interesting point, but I just don't think that I, I, I feel like they're just inserted for the sake of inserting mm. them. Like this is a great idea. Let's put it in there. Kind of acting rather than what well, let's what kind of value does this add to the scene? What kind of value does this add to the narrative? And it doesn't mean every single visual cue or like little nod or, or conversational nod has to be like of, of great value or something, or that there can't be little Easter eggs or something. But I do think that when you start to see them so often, they come across as more like, wouldn't this be fun if we just did this? And from a direction standpoint, that sounds yeah. great because it's like you're, it's it's serving the director's vision. You're getting a real sense of how the director wanted to portray this black experience and everything. And and going kind of overboard on a lot of different caricatures is like one of the ways to do that. Uh, I just think that it was done like twenty too many times, and I just that that's kind of like. I guess from a from a pacing standpoint and from like a I guess just like being more cohesive in general with the message you're trying to portray um, rather than kind of just like machine gunning off different ideas and then just not really like wrapping them together necessarily uh, and like I said it doesn't mean that there needs to be a colossal message there doesn't need to be, we were just talking about true stories and that has freaking it's just like the same way uh it's just kind of like the approach and the themes are a lot different but uh in this in this sense like 
it, it feels like a personable film. It feels like there's there's a lot of really compelling messaging, and there's definitely things that you can learn, I guess. But I, I, it, it feels too personable. Mm-hmm. It almost feels like there's too much like single person ideas going on here rather than like meticulously deciding how could we portray such a nuanced like multifaceted concept uh without like just making a meme out of it or just like making it like this is my first go at this i'm just gonna go for it kind Mm. of thing and that's from a viewer's perspective like i feel like coming from a filmmaker's perspective it's a lot different because you're just starting out and you're trying to collect all these different ideas and seeing what fits and what doesn't and and how you can best portray the messaging you're trying to portray but in my sense it just felt a little bit too far left and right field it felt like there's too many things coming across at once and uh as well as, and that definitely hurts it more as a horror film and rather than like a thriller where you can kind of get away with a lot more like jerky crazy things happening uh, whereas I feel like with a horror film you, you really have to covet that the, the horror covet the horror in the horror film <laughs> <laughs> I, I will maybe agree sure. the theme of the the recurring theme of the deer I think is a little vague um and mm-hmm. I think some of that actually ended up being cut out of the movie because the trailer for this movie, there's like a deer skeleton monster in one shot that definitely isn't in the movie. Um, huh. So I, th- I think maybe even Jordan Peele and the editors were like, yeah, we don't need that. I don't know. <laughs> Let's just keep the deer thing vague. But I, I, to more directly address your question about the ending, though, Christian, I did want to say one thing that kind of annoyed me a little bit. Not annoyed, but it just kind of nagged at me. And maybe I missed, like, a piece of dialogue or an explanation at some point, but I I think the grandfather is meant to have created the coagula process, but I think the only discussion we ever have of the grandfather is as um, a a runner who's beaten by by Jesse Owens. So he went from Mm -hmm. Olympic runner to genius brain surgeon and i feel like there's a few steps missing there that aren't explained at all and that co- does kind of bug me a little bit um yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i i hear you there i think that's something that you say you, you ultimately weigh like the cost benefit analysis of, of explaining that further or finding another angle of approach and then peel probably decided that the story's better off not not muddying the waters to explain mm-hmm. that too much, but I, I I see where you're coming from there. Um, I sort of forgot that he had the. And now that you're saying it, I totally remember the whole Jesse Owens thing, um, but I I sort of forgot that um, when when Parker's running and I I it I didn't piece together at all that that Parker and Georgina were the grandparents until um, the girlfriend literally called her grandma and then it, then it was like oh my gosh mm-hmm. this this all makes sense now, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, we, we love Christopher Nolan now because of Oppenheimer, of course. But um, I, was a, I was a little worried going into this that this would be like what Zach mentioned in one of our old episodes, like the obnoxious Christopher Nolan explaining memento video where like every little <laughs> side detail in the first hour is like, you, you're not smart enough to understand it, but it's there. Um, um, yeah. And I, I thought it would be overt or really like self-referential. And I don't think it's that at all. I think... Um, I think like like you said about the deer thing that that maybe kind of was cut or wasn't cut. Some things are just there to be there, mm-hmm. which I think is a good thing. I don't think there needs to be an explanation for every little detail. Like the same mm-hmm. way how in Nope there's this whole like side story with the chimp that doesn't really contribute to the to the main plot of Nope, but it's riveting on its own and and you know, I think earns its screen time. We should talk um, about Nope sometime cuz I think that has a lot more to do with the main <laughs> plot than that we've ever nodded to, but this episode <laughs> okay. isn't about Nope, so it's Okay, mm, maybe next yeah. season. Don't tempt me. <laughs> Gosh. Um but in in retrospect, I think um I think it in, it enhances the story rather than being like an annoying thing or a like uh smug director thing um but the the thing that i noticed the most um is when they're um when he's like outside and sort of talking to his girlfriend about how he's freaked out and he needs to go um and then she's like okay we'll go it's it's fine i I love you and then she like embraces him and it's i was like that's like a really weird angle for them to be hugging and then it's like she's literally got him in a headlock 
um, or, or something. And um, the visual language is, is obviously deliberate there. And, and I think effective. I don't think it's, um, you know, like elevated horror to the, to the point where it's like some really pretentious thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, um, I, I wanted to touch on the score briefly. There's not a ton of score here, but, um, and when I was, um, at, at Kenyon, uh, finishing up undergrad, I was in a, uh, music and entrepreneurship class and we had, um, one of our homework assignments was to go on this website that was full of, um, I don't know if it was like called 21st century musicians or whatever, but the, the whole angle was um, um, people that found ways um, to incorporate music uh, or to approach music as an occupation in like a different way or a non-traditional way. And um, we basically just had to read about someone and then like give a brief presentation in class. And I landed on Michael Abels, who is uh, the composer um, for this film and for Nope and us and uh, since get out has done more more hollywood films in general uh, but before jordan peele found him he hadn't really broken through he was just uh, a working composer um that had sort of made his own music and and put it out independently for i, I want to say over a decade and i think um while, while um in sort of the pre-production stages or production stages of get out um jordan peele um took it upon himself to research some some black composers that hadn't gotten a ton of headway in Hollywood uh, to try to give uh, the, the music and get out a, a more distinct voice than the score that you hear uh, a lot of the rest of the time. So I just wanted to ask you guys, um, did it, was it distinct to you? Um, I, I know it's, it's not ever present. It's, it's mostly only in these, the, the sunken place and, and towards the end when the horror is really ratcheting up. But what did you make of the score? I, I would agree with you that I don't think it's, I think this is a good wallpaper score. It's not like a Carpenter wallpaper score where he sits, hits the same key for 15 minutes, but um, <laughs> I, it complements that's, the movie that's cinema. without ever becoming <laughs> distracting. But, I, I mean, I had not heard about the the story of how he was hired for this, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Christian, because I, I do think that that's a... It's, it's a great example of the opinion I always try to espouse on, like, art in general. And that's, you know, if you're making your thing and you like your thing, don't compromise yourself. And at some point, mm -hmm. if you keep putting work out into the world, it will find an audience of some kind. Um, and mm -hmm. that audience might be Jordan Peele and you might end up <laughs> scoring a, an Oscar-winning movie. So, you know, very inspiring, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought the one point where it was distracting was the windpipe when it sounded like Uncle Iroh is going to come out when he's at the <laughs> party. And, and, it, and he's <laughs> uh, and he's walking up to Andre. Yeah, that was like the only distracting part, maybe. Also, like the quick little string things uh, with jump scares, like uh, I see that cinema sins right there. Take off like a million points every time you go, and it's like, yeah. oh, Georgina's walking across the screen for the third time. I do think, <laughs> but otherwise, that's it. That's it, though. Those are the only times where it's like really distracting. Otherwise, I agree with Zach. It's more like a wallpaper score, and it doesn't. It, it totally, sir. It's it's. I'm glad that it's there, and it's there, and it works. It just works. I, I do think the violin stings have gotten a lot more overused since this movie came out. Um, that whole mm -hmm. kind of like first wave of like A24 elevated horror, it was kind of like, it, it was like a, a smarter replacement for boom, like the typical 2000s <laughs> Casio keyboard jump scare sound. <laughs> and now every A24 trailer is long shot of woods. <laughs> A baby in a cot, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's it's gotten to the point of overuse. I think. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, I wonder if I peeped the audio there. And you know, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan of jump scares at all in general. Like like when people ask me if I like horror movies, I, I tend to say yes if there's more to it, and if there aren't a ton of jump scares because I don't like jump scares. There, I don't think it's hard or artful to to get a jump scare in, and there are a few here and. Um, Mostly in the, in the very beginning, like when they hit the deer and mm -hmm. um, when he's when he's first at the house um, and he goes outside. Um, oh yeah, and she just turns out much. the window. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, it didn't bother me too much in the in the third act because I, I feel like there's more of a sort of forward momentum that almost felt to me more like a like an action scene playing out rather than like like still moment ah this moment is still again. Um, I, I, my favorite part of the score is um, this choral bit that plays at the very end and, and a couple other times. I, I don't I, I don't really know how to describe it properly, but there's just like this dissonant. Um, it's, there's there are singers and and you can hear them and you know there's not oh. a ton of, of choral music and in scores in general. I mean, the surgery n- scene. Oh <laughs> yeah. yeah, gosh. <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh. like the the only other choral music in in a film that that jumps to head right now is um is Duel of the Fates. <laughs> but, um, All right, the I, omen. get out. Yeah, I'm the sorry. omen is very uh, choral as well. Yeah, the omen. Yeah, the omen. Oh crazy. right, yeah, and it's it's great there too. So <laughs> For, <laughs> shot of shot child. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm not biased at all, by the way. Um, <laughs> choral singing for, gosh, a long time now. But um, I just think the way that that Abel's composed that is really clever. So, okay. Um, any any final thoughts on on Get Out on Jordan Peele's debut? I, uh, I know you haven't watched it, Christian. Are we open to discussing the vague idea of the alternate ending? Because I think it would be an intriguing point, but. Please, I'm just going to take my headphones off because I, I, okay. I'm so spoiler averse. Finally, me but, and Zach. But sure. no, I'll listen back after <laughs> I've watched it myself. I, I guess this is a, a question I can pose to you then, Mitchell. Um, and I don't know if you've seen anything right, ready, of this alternate ending. I'm pretty sure I did see it. But yeah, originally we'll, at we'll the end, instead of Rod showing up from, with, from the TSA, mm. it's two mm. actual police officers, and they assume mm. that he has attacked his girlfriend and like committed multiple murders and like it ends with him in prison. Um, And the question I wanted to pose was how that affects, like how that would have affected your feeling on the film if it was the actual ending. And if the ending that we got feels better suited to the movie as a whole. I definitely think leaving it to the audience to decipher it is way more valuable because they already had done that once with the cop in the mm-hmm. beginning. And I think hitting hitting the nail on the head after they had already hit the nail on the head with that theme multiple times in the film, uh, I think, and really with the, the twist itself is basically the biggest nail on the head, the nail in the coffin. Uh, and I think, I think leaving it is fine. Instead of just trying to turn it into another like narrative i think it was uh, everyone at least for the most part i i understand that the intent was to think that it was going to be like a brutality situation yeah. or something some bias such you know at the very least so i thought that it was great when he opens the door and it just says tsa uh, yeah. airport on it it's like yes and i like yes that's rod but so yeah uh i can see why it's an alternate ending but yeah i it totally it's like this is like i am legend like we know why the ending is the ending don't don't <laughs> don't do that (laughs) yeah i definitely agree with you i think even though that ending i mean i don't think you could say that it would like feel out of place like i think it would Mm. feel maybe Mm. even like a little ham-handed and overselling the point in addition to the fact that you know you've seen him just go through this whole ordeal i feel like in (laughs) this kind of a film that is kind of slick and funny every now and then and has these comedy cutaways I think it's fine to have like a slightly more upbeat ending um, rather yeah, than just like ride it out. Just him ride being it out. walked away <laughs> in, an, in an orange jumpsuit, which should have been so depressing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm glad we had this discussion and maybe Christian yeah. can drop his thoughts at some later point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You can come back, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. I wonder what I missed. I can't wait to listen back later. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's uh, interesting. Okay. Good job, Zach. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, good job, Zach. <laughs> Tentatively <laughs> awaiting approval. Um, gosh, um, I don't know if I have any final thoughts other than I'm really glad. Um, oh. <laughs> 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 the Skype I used emojis the clapping are back. Function. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, I'm glad that the ending was uh, not what I thought it was initially, which was um, just like a, a, a police car coming up to, to take him away because um, mostly because I, that was like the one part of the movie that I did find very predictable. Like it was very obvious to me that that was why she was like 
egging him on or letting him choke her or whatever. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I, it feels like, um, at that point, I feel like the film had earned the sort of happier ending and Lil Rel is so, um, so, so likable and so funny. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I was totally with this and I, I, I understand totally why this is like a Zach three out of five because of the things that, that Zach looks for in a film. But, um, I, I think for me, this is like exactly, um, exactly what it what appeals to me um, in, in a lot of ways. So uh, a very strong four and a half out of five for me. And I'm going to try us this month too. I'm, I'm on a little bit of a, of a horror kick, which I've never done like a, like a horror movie October ever, but I think I'm, I'm going to for the first time <laughs> there you go. in the midst of it. Live a little. With Get Out. That's <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You see what you've done. You've ruined me. You've corrupted <laughs> me, Zach. Uh, <laughs> goodness. Well, uh, I guess we can do uh, a week in review if you guys are up for that. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep things, uh, keep things spoopy. Um, <laughs> this is, it's pretty early October still right now. This episode should come out on the 13th and we're recording a little, little less than a week ahead of time. Um, but I've already been watching quite a bit of horror. I've had a couple of, of, uh, Halloween marathons with some friends already in the build up to, to the big, the big day, the big holiday giveaway. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the most recent spooky thing that I, I have experienced uh, as of the recording of this episode is um, over the past month and a half, I think, I decided to read Robert Block's Psycho Trilogy, the, the, the books upon which hmm. Hitchcock's first movie is, is based, and then the sequels have nothing to do with the sequel books. So I read the original Psycho, which is pretty strong. I think the movie is a better take on the story than the book is, but the book is also doing a few things differently that I'd be interested to see adapted um, in a totally different kind of movie. Uh, Psycho 2 is uh, strange. It kind of the original Psycho feels like Robert Block like had a quota to write like a cheap little horror paperback that would sell in like gas stations, um, and he wrote a surprisingly effective little story. And then Psycho 2 was written like two decades later, and he's trying to make like this statement on like violence in the media and the plot is basically that Norman Bates goes to Hollywood cause he hears they're making a movie about him. <laughs> um, and it's kind of funny, but then the, which it's meant to be, but then the ending has that thing, which I find for so many like journeyman authors is an issue. I had this issue with so many of the James Bond books where it feels like Robert Block wrote like three quarters of a really solid book and then went, Eh, I'm bored. Let's finish this. And then it wraps up in like 20 pages. Um, and then Psycho House, which is the third one and the one that I finished today, is just just like a like a fart in the wind. It, it, it was re- released in 1990. So that's that's like 35 years after the first book. And over the course of the previous two books, like everything that defines Psycho has like is no longer in the books. So, like, Norman isn't around anymore, Mother isn't around anymore, Lila and Sam Loomis aren't around anymore, the hotel and the house aren't around anymore. So, so reading, how is it a psycho? <laughs> yeah, reading the book, it's, it's set in the same town, and the concept of Psycho House is that, like, decades after the original Norman Bates murders, um... There's like a local businessman who is rebuilding the motel and the house to turn them into a tourist trap. Uh, And then murders start happening around that, which feels like, I don't know, to me it felt like a very flimsy premise because you like have to literally rebuild the setting of the first book in order to even have the novel happen. (laughs) Um, And then there's like no remaining characters to work with. So it's just a bunch of people we don't know wandering around talking about like, there's they go to the Chinese restaurant so many times and talk about nothing and it, it was I was really disappointed by it um Psycho 2 wasn't great but it was at least like an attempt to do something and Psycho House kind of just felt like I uh, he wanted to write another Psycho book but there was there was no materials left to to make a Psycho book out of he wanted to to make a sandwich but his only materials were like a <laughs> 
keel from a, a normal bread loaf, half of a hamburger bun, and like mayonnaise. And he went, there we go, that's a sandwich. And it might technically be a sandwich, it might technically be a book, but uh, I... It tastes like I crap. don't really know if I want to eat that sandwich, if I'm totally honest. So this is one of the... I think this is one of the first books I've ever given a one out of five. R- really not quality. Wow. I really recommend the first Psycho. Mm. That's a four out of five novel for me. I even recommend Psycho 2, even though that's like a two out of five novel, just because I think it's an interesting take on a sequel. But you can do with that Psycho house. It's it's totally forgettable. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll just say, um, if you're interested in hearing about Psycho 2, the sequel film, Ooh. stay tuned to my letterbox, because Ooh. I intend to make that part of my October horror marathon. Wow. That's, so there you go. That's a good choice. The, the second movie is solid. All right. Well, I got, I got a good one to add to your roster. It should be the first one you watch. It's Laser Blast, <laughs> all right? Laser Blast from 1978. All right? Spooky. Have you seen that makeup? <laughs> Full Moon Productions, okay? <laughs> Full Moon. This is this is peak, peak sci-fi cinema right now. Um, this literally rivaled Star Wars. And it was, literally. But it rivaled Star Wars. He shoots Wars. the sign in the movie. He, he blows up oh, the geez. sign that says Star Wars out now. <laughs> and it was great. <laughs> um, man, the explosion is in the... God, the explosions in this uh, are awesome. Uh... That's what I gotta say. Um, the characters, there's every character in a sci-fi film ever is in this. You get even got the cops, the big cop and the thin cop, and the FBI agent and the everybody, the 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 nerdy kid and the 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 cool jock kid. It's all there. It's all there. They all get blown up. <laughs> Sorry, they all get blown up, and it's awesome. And the aliens are turtles in stop motion, and it's great. And it, it really just, it's so simple, and it's just, like, a lot of ways, it, it, it's almost like a Hulk, like, TV show episode or something, <laughs> where it's just, and then, but then it just ends, and there's no more Hulk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically what it is. Uh, and it was, it was really fun to watch. I mean, like, you know, there's clearly a commitment with what little budget there was. There was a commitment to have the best explosions possible. How many cars <laughs> can you like and then see them get blown up? It's an emotional experience for car people, and I, I, <laughs> I really enjoyed that. But, yeah, I mean, it's a freaking B-movie. It's 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 total goofy goofiness, and, you know, the, the, the acting's not even that bad, but, I mean... Man, it's just it's carrying one explosion to the other. That's still every purpose of every conversation. Um, yeah, I want the laser gun. It's cool. <laughs> so, two out of five. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, I've I've referenced my my horror marathon a few times now, and I, I've I've seen a few things uh, since uh, watching Get Out in preparation for this episode. I watched uh, the Revenge of Frankenstein, the the first Hammer sequel, which I I had mixed feelings on. Um, I saw I Know What You Did Last Summer, which is mostly just a thirst trap. And <laughs> <laughs> what I want to focus on here is a Frankenstein 1931, the classic, okay. uh, featuring Boris Karloff as a monster and directed by James Whale. And um, we didn't talk about it on the podcast, but uh, the three of us watched uh, The Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, um, we had a, a, a sad movie night. Um, yeah. a sad movie night planned, and the the list was uh, Bride of Frankenstein, The Green Mile, and, and Schindler's, Schindler's List. list. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. that was a brutal You're welcome. night for all of us. But uh, some great <laughs> films, and um, I, I really wanted to, to get to Frankenstein, and I saw that they uh, were streaming. It was streaming on Peacock, and I was like, now's the time. So um, I, I liked it. You know, I landed on a three point five out of five. It didn't really. Um, blow me away the same way that Bride of Frankenstein did. Um, I gave that a, a strong four, and I think if I rewatched Bride, I might even up that more. But, um, yeah, I think the, the, the biggest limiting factors to, to the, the original classic are, um, Zach alludes to this in his review, are the, um, the, the technical elements of it um, being on, on this, like, soundstage, and um, a lot of the actors are giving this really, like, puffed-up um, theatrical uh, performance, and um, 
you really feel that, especially in the first half hour or so before the monster comes to life. It's 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 a pretty brutal wait. But um, once Boris Karloff comes on, gosh, I mean, everything he does is like really tragic and I, I think profound. Um, I don't know if he thought of it that way or if the director thought was thinking that deeply of it when they were making it. But um, gosh, every little shuffle and, and murmur is like really uh, saddening to me. And uh, the scene with with um, him him and the little girl and when they're they're tossing flowers into the water and uh, where that goes is just is so sad so so moving um gosh and so i I, three three and a half out of out of five for um karloff's amazing performance and for of course the um uh, tremendous integrity of of mary shelley's original story and and the way that it has endured and um it's just timelessly iconic so um yeah a a classic for a good reason yeah okay and now i'm running from the angry townspeople yes (laughs) with torches (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, God. you're running faster than jesse owens oh, oh I, I didn't say that <laughs> i did not say that <laughs> it's from the movie okay i didn't say it myself true true, true. gosh true. Oh. getting out oh. my timer yeah. i'm all out of the zach's just gonna go with what i said that's cool oh are you getting out your timer no huh? I, the, with the oh okay down. you just liked what i said i'm huh? that good yeah. at it Zach, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I'll be back in the writer's chair in short order, though. It's true. I'll, I'll get you yeah. back. He's gonna get his revenge. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, man. I'm pivoting yeah. from the marvelous cinematour to being the subject of the rundown again. So I'm, <laughs> yes. I, can, I can never stop the torture. Um, <laughs> All righty, one minute on the timer. Um, who, who's gonna, who's gonna start, Mitchell? Uh, you can start. Okie dokie. Uh, we begin the rundown in three, two, one. Obama's third term. <laughs> two out of five. One down, couple hundred thousand to go. Two out of five. Jesse Owens. Four out of five. Hypnosis smoking here. Two out of five. Talking about sports. Three out of five. Sunken place. Three out of five. A real doggone keeper. <laughs> two out of five. The pendulum swinging back. Two out of five. Blind art dealer. Four out of five. Sparklers and bingo. Three out of five. Rodney Williams. Three out of five. Behold the coagula. Two out of five. Cotton balls. Mm, Two out of five. Top NCAA (laughs) prospects. Four out of five. (laughs) Right, and that is our complete list. It's a bit short, but... Oh, uh, Oh my gosh. Well, I'm glad that we ended on... um, the the funniest the one moment that really made me like howl when laughter was when she googles NCAA prospect. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that killed me. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, all right. I don't think we have anything to preview. This is our special, but um, maybe you'll see special us special. on another um, special um, calendar relevant occasion <laughs> in, in the not too distant future. I think they know the deal at this point. This. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's yeah. not, it's not, it's mysterious. not, it's not Hanukkah. <laughs> it's not Kwanzaa. <laughs> it's not Yom Kippur. That already happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, keep your eyes peeled for the for the trailer that usually drops around Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, banger Zach trailer. I can't wait. What piece of classical music right. will I use this year? <laughs> yeah, Andy Williams. <laughs> Please note that we do not right. own any of the footage used in Zach's <laughs> teaser trailer. <laughs> it's Disclaimer. fine. We don't make any money. They'll never it. catch me. <laughs> we, lo- we, lo- we lose gas money. That's what we do. We lose gas money. That's it. Yep. All right. Okay, bye. <laughs> Get out. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween.